guys. Hope you're all doing good. Guys, welcome to the next OMR series. I hope you're all enjoying this uh, because we're going to do the most tricky, difficult, or probably the most commonly tested task which we have chosen. So today's task is all about preeclampsia, which is an evolving scenario as a structured discussion. So do not forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, it is the difficult road which you must always take because the beautiful dreams are the reality stands at the other side of the road. So do not hesitate. Whatever you're feeling, the stress and the anxiety, that is quite natural. So go for it. And this would definitely help you to achieve your dream. Okay, so we shall be starting off. I'm just trying to keep my timer so that we will finish on time. So yes, so this would be my task for today. Hi, Aisha. Hi, Soumya. Hi, hi. So let's start off. Just a minute. I'm just keeping the timer off. <clears throat> okay. Hello, I'm Soumya, one of the candidates for the exam. I've gone through the scenario and I'm happy to start the discussion. Hello, Soumya. So how is the day going? Yeah, it's all good. Thank you so much. Okay. Can you summarize the case for me? Yeah, sure. Here I have an advanced maternal age woman who is around 41 year old. With uh, She's actually at 28 weeks, which is a third trimester, as well as she's my more, more concern is her blood pressure is 140 by 98. So we are dealing with... Uh, probably pre-eclampsia here with the proteinuria there. And definitely I would uh, also want to see that because she uh, looks like she's conceived after the infertility treatment. So I really want to look into the detailed history and examination to uh, manage her further on. And why is she here in the early morning? Okay, so what information do you want to gather from her? Yes, definitely uh, because of the first and foremost thing I would want to know regarding her uh, Pre-eclampsia, probably. So whether she has got any impending symptoms like the headache or the epigastric pain and uh, whether any vomiting. So I really want to know because I would want to rule out the eclampsia part of in her. And definitely I would uh, want to see what medication she's on, whether she's started on aspirin and what blood test she's on and whether she has been on any antihypertensives already. And coming to her obstetric history, uh, whether this is any uh, conception followed by IVF for the natural conception and uh, uh, again, the blood test and the scans have been done so far. How is it doing? And uh, what about the baby's movements, whether she's perceiving the baby's movements? And also uh, family history of hypertension, because I don't know whether it's a case of chronic hypertension or whether it is a preeclampsia or superimposed, I don't know. And also I would want to look into her support at home and also the allergies. Uh, so specifically, I would want to look into these things in the history. And when it comes to the examination, I would want to have a general physical examination I need to make sure that she is not in state of impending eclampsia and uh, measuring her, mainly checking on her clonus and having a look on her baby like symphysia height, fetal heart rate and already the midwife has measured the blood test and also we have got a four plus protein urea which is very concerning thing for me so and definitely I would want to review her previous notes for the previous urine protein as well okay her pregnancy was due to IVF with donor eggs and she's allergic to aspirin and a history of feeling uh, are generally unwell since 24 hours. She has marked epigastric pain since 12 hours. And a fundal light on examination is 25 centimeter. It's transverse lie and heartbeat is hurt at a rate of 140 per second. And she has a severe headache too. Uh, as you are reviewing her history and also her notes, she suffers a generalized convulsion. So how do you manage her further? Okay, now this is an obstetrical emergency where this is an eclampsia with uh, a severe uh, IUGA baby with a transverse life. So mother is a priority, so I would call for help. So the senior uh, uh, anesthetist, my consultant obstetrician, and the registrars and the midwives, and also I would need to inform my the neonatology team as well. And the first and foremost thing is when she is convulsing, I have to put her to the uh, make sure that she doesn't fall and protect her airway. Once the convulsions stop, immediately I would want to do a couple of things like uh, airway. Uh, I need to protect and uh, definitely the oxygen to be started and for IV access. Obviously, uh, because. 
the moment I started taking the history, she started having the convulsion. So I need to send a couple of blood investigations, full blood count, specifically the platelets. And also I would want to have a coagulation screen for her and also the group and save. And also I would want to see her blood urea, serum, creatinine, electrolytes and spot PCR if because protein urea is anyways 4 plus and I would want to look into her LFTs. So these investigations, I really need to get them quickly on board. And then I would want to start with uh, the catheter has to be put in intake output chart because we need to be very specific. The fluid intake shouldn't be more than 80 ml per hour because it's at a risk of, risk of pulmonary edema. And also the continuous monitoring of her. So I need a scribbler to write down everything and the continuous monitoring using the IMEOS chart. And also so we need to start very, very quickly the anti-convulsant therapy that is the magnesium sulfate. So magnesium sulfate, 4 gram IV bolus within a, a like slow IV in 10 to 15 minutes and the maintenance dose of 1 gram per hour. And obviously if there is a recurrence fit, then we need to give 2 gram bolus and maintenance of 1.5 gram per hour. And there will be continuous measuring of the blood pressure, pulse, oxy, uh, uh, oxygen saturation. And also, we need to definitely monitor because she has been started on the magnesium sulfate, deep tendon reflexes, urine output, and respiratory rate because we shouldn't be doing the magnesium toxicity. It has to be in the range of four to eight. So and, uh, not to forget the baby, we need to think of continuous monitoring of the baby as well and keeping the neonatologist in loop as well. So those are the main things which I would want to do. First, I need to protect the mother from getting the next convulsions at the same time thinking of the probably delivery versus continuing the pregnancy. Okay, her mean arterial blood pressure is 142 now. How would you manage? Okay, so once we have settled down with this, then definitely the role of anti becomes important, even though magnesium sulfate controls the blood pressures as well. However, here the first medications which I would want to think of is labetalol IV. So obviously it comes in the dosage of 5 milligram per ml. And so which we give in 10 ml so it comes around like 50 milligram you can give as a uh, like you will be giving and the maximum dose uh, which you will be giving is 200 milligram uh, but the main thing which i need to think is uh, asthma should be ruled out i know that there is no history like that and also with uh, caution it should be used in caution with cardiac disease and if uh, labetalol is contraindicated or if it is not there then i think of hydralazine hydralazine the problem is we need to discuss with the anesthetist. Sometimes we might have to give 500 ml crystalloid and because it's a direct uh, arterial dilator. And if uh, uh, after that, we will be giving 2.5 milligram. Maximum, uh, we can give and repeat after 20 minutes. So hydralazine would be given. Definitely calcium channel blockers could be given, but sublingual should be avoided. But because the mean arterial pressure is 142 and I would want to avoid the cardio cerebrovascular accidents, I would go for the IV infusions. Okay, in view of IUGR, CS was decided. So how do you manage her further? Definitely cesarean section because she's a 28 weeker with a transverse life who just had an eclampsia. So uh, first thing I would... Uh, my consultant is the one who will be doing the cesarean section and the neonatologist should be, it should be discussed with the, uh, the neonatologist about the availability of the NICU bed and the steroid cover because it's a 28 weeker, but the rescue dose of steroids can only be thought of because we are going to go ahead with the cesarean and we need to think of the risk of PPH. So I would definitely want to keep my bloods ready and make sure that she is not Jehovah. And starting from, uh, and the senior anesthetist should be there because for the analysis Anesthesia part of it, anesthesia part of it, epidural could be given unless there is contraindication of platelets because in these women, general anesthesia could be quite difficult because of the laryngeal edema, what they can have. And then uh, the, during the surgery, the skin to skin, uh, obviously there are a couple of things which we need to follow. The skin incision could be vertical or financial depending upon the operator's experience. But when it comes to the uterine incision, the incision is definitely to be higher than what we generally put because she's 28 weeker and the excision uh, and the extraction of the baby because it is transverse like. So we need to uh, do uh, the assisted breech extraction. So need to think of lateral extension. So it has to be done by a senior uh, consultant. And after that, we need to be be vigilant for active management of third stage of labor and making sure that we will not be pushing too much of fluids at the same time avoiding ergometrin and after that uh, once the cesarean section is uh, done the baby would be handed over to the neonatologist and we will be making sure that uh, the paid cardboard gas samples are taken as well and then the mother has to be shifted to the 
HDU as well. Because in uh, because she just had an eclampsia, we need to make sure to continuous monitor her and maintain on IMEO start and magnesium sulfate should be to be continued for 24 hours and as well as the antihypertensives and making sure that she would be at a risk of VTEC. So early ambulation, hydration and maintaining the balance between bleeding and the coagulation. So pharmacological methods should be started. Once the bleeding risk reduces, we can go for the um, I mean, mechanical should be started once the bleeding risk reduces, we go for the pharmacological management. And obviously for the breastfeeding part and all, we can uh, think later on. And once she is uh, in HDU, once she's stabilized, then usually what the step down protocol would be like after 48 to 72 hours, the platelet transaminase would be done. And then the call will be of the intensivist to step down to her post-op care. Okay. So how do you manage her post bottom or post-operatively post-operative care is very very essential because there is an increased risk of more complications like having an eclampsia again and as well as the vt risk so we need to be very vigilant for these and the blood uh, and also the blood pressure needs to be monitored and also we need to make sure about the anti because ac inhibitors is the best and if for example, in Afro-Caribbean, we would want to avoid that. Otherwise, uh, AC inhibitors are the best, which could be given. And also pro supporting for the breastfeeding once the baby gets out of the NICU. And also, uh, we need to think of the contraception. And the follow-up with the GP would be usually six to eight weeks. And probably after six, three months, they have to review with the nephrologist as well. But very, very important counseling the women what exactly happened. And we need to make sure the incident reporting is done uh, because she has thrown the eclampsia convulsions. And also, so explaining are the recurrence of uh, preeclampsia in future pregnancies, as well as uh, probably to have a multidisciplinary team care in the next pregnancies as well. Okay. Anything you want to add? Uh, no, uh, but uh, yeah, these are the basic things. And uh, yeah, because she is at a risk, her risk has been increased because of the uh, age and as well as the donor oocyte. So that has to be put across to her at the time of going home because she might have her questions. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Aisha, how was it? I don't know. Like too many things and eclampsias yes. are always very difficult to yes. you know, cross in mm -hmm. one way. So, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the first question, the summarize, uh, you have summarized it well. And the uh, initial management, yes, you talked about all the history, the impending symptoms, whichever you wanted to ask, like, uh, epigastric pain, headache are the ones which are very important. We, we, you need to ask even the vomiting. They, they might be think they might be thinking it could be simple gastritis, right? Yeah. So that all the history and investigations, whichever work was supposed to send, you have mentioned about it. And then uh, talking about the initial management, A, B, C, you have explained it beautifully. And left lateral tilt is the one. Uh, I think uh, you just missed because uh, when she's throwing into fits, uh, there could be some, again, obstruction. So you have to just uh, mention that and uh, uh, rest. I think uh, everything you have mentioned beautifully. Once uh, the you know that patient is thrown fits or has generalized convulsion, starting with the magnesium sulfate is the protocol. Uh, but then you have talked about labetalol, hydralizine, and uh, that was all correct. Coming to the caesarean part, you have beautifully explained uh, the incision, what are the precautions to be taken during the caesarean section. The most important point here was uh, involving the consultant, which is the patient safety uh, that you have mentioned very well. These are the some of the points which has to be highlighted. What I say is you cannot miss those points. And yes. uh, yeah, coming to the postpartum, uh, one thing I thought you missed was a BP monitoring, which is very important. Yeah. 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 That, that's very important postpartum because, you know, uh, there could be a risk that she might have, she might feel better, but still the BP might have yeah. been, you know, shoot up or something like that. So yes. BP monitoring postpartum is very important. Yeah. Rest everything you have covered. Okay, thank you, Aisha. So like I was, lots of thoughts were racing in my mind because I wanted yes, to cover yeah. everything. So, and um, uh, about left lateral tilt, I was more worried of uh, making her not fall. Definitely left lateral tilt, I have to specifically mention. Yes. And uh, probably I was trying to think of the dosages, but it's okay if they do not talk about the dosages also because it takes some time for you to recollect and answer. 
So, and uh, definitely uh, I wanted to add on about the nifedipine because uh, that's very particularly very important thing. And postnatal, it was very much in my mind to mention that first three days she has to be in hospital. But anyway, she was eclamptic. So I thought of ruling out that. And yes, uh, uh, main points, I think I have covered, uh, but it is a very lengthy scenario to be very honest. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. you lengthy have to scenario. cover a lot of things. And if you try to justify and if you, do not go in like you know like like question and answer mode when you try to answer it would be probably last bit you would miss on but i think it's very very important to mention the ndt and it would be a valving scenario so it won't be straightforward or they can give you straight away somebody's convulsing how would you go about in that case we need to think of epilepsy and all other differential diagnosis which uh needs to mention so i am not to forget the baby and definitely here it was transversely also so that also ate away my time talking about how the extraction and all that but that's how it would be so i think if we talk about this it should be a clear pass and do not forget the postpartum management especially the vt because they always come back with eclampsia and the vt and the recurrent stress as well and please make sure when you talk about the history intentionally i didn't speak about a couple of things like uh, other comorbidities or uh, probably surgeries i didn't want to talk about because i know the time is very less so you can speak very less minimal and then go on obviously if you can fit in a lot of things and uh, even if you cover the whole of the task it's a good to go okay thank you aisha thank you so much for always helping me to finish the task thank you so much thank, thank you thank you all the best guys so watch uh, actually these sessions because this we are really taking time out to prepare and then discuss and then do it in the best possible way so that it will be useful for you just like that uh, we are actually it is not easy for the mentors to retake like an exam so that's what we are trying to do because it i always believe in doing the difficult things because that gives out the best of the quality thank you guys hope you're all liking please don't forget to drop your comments in the below this video thank you guys thank you so much